right. Thank you, uh, John, for joining us. I really appreciate you being here uh, for this conversation. Uh, this is exciting to me because I think you had an amazing career path. And let me start by just getting you to introduce yourself and uh, give the audience a little bit of a, a background on your career path. Yeah, absolutely. And appreciate the opportunity to chat, Caesar. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, hello, everybody. My name is John Kepalukas. I go by Fallout in the gaming industry, uh, former professional gamer. So, from 13 to 19 years old, I competed uh, professionally in the Major League Gaming Pro Circuit. I was on Team Envy playing Gears of War with Nick Merckx and I had Distortion and some other folks uh, way back when esports was still kind of budding. And uh, stopped competing, stopped playing in college, started commentating just on the side. Again, was very passionate about esports. And then also actually started working at, at Microsoft um, and as a senior in, in college and first job out of college. Uh, so since then, I've been at Microsoft for about eight or nine years full time in a variety of roles. And still, I'm really, really involved in the esports world as a broadcaster, play by play commentator, show host, you name it, for games like Apex Legends, Fortnite, Gears of War, Halo, Madden, and, and others. All right, perfect. So I, I guess the first question I'd have for you is, um, what is a, a really fun memory or kind of a highlight uh, of your career that came out of your, your background as an esports um, uh, professional? Uh, what's kind of a highlight or something that you look back on and, and was really exciting or fun for you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say like the personal fun highlight, you know, if I think of just if I close my eyes and think of one moment in my entire career that I'll just never forget, just a fun one, is uh, crowd surfing in Mexico City after a major Gears esports pro circuit event. And uh, the fans of Mexico are huge, rabid Gears fans and um, told me to jump. And I did. So that was kind of a personal highlight. I'd say the overall highlight, though, is uh, just the, the fact that I get to merge my true passion with my profession. And it's really interesting because early on, you know, when I was a kid, I, I was just so passionate about video games. When I was playing professionally at a young age, again, esports wasn't even close to what it is now. You could barely even make a, a, a decent salary or a living competing in video games. But I knew I was a part of something that was bigger than myself. And I knew with 100% certainty that one day I'd be able to tell my grandkids or my kids that I was the first wave, the first generation of esports professional, and that this thing's going to be bigger than any traditional sport one day. Um, so being able to then take that passion from a young age and now kind of get to do that at, you know, at Microsoft and, and have some really exciting and fun roles where I'm shaping the kind of gaming or esports industry is, is probably my overall highlight. Awesome. So I, I love the crowd surfing example. And, and I, I was thinking, you know, for me, uh, growing up playing Nintendo, the idea that at some point I could play Nintendo and be playing for a massive audience of people uh, cheering for me and crowd surfing, playing a video game would have just been mind boggling. Um, but, uh, you know, that leads me to, to, to ask the next question is what's changed? What uh, what's happened between w when I was a kid playing uh, playing video games and where we are now? Yeah, that's a great question. It's funny. I, you know, I, I used to be embarrassed when I played in high school. I didn't tell anyone because I thought people would label me as a high schooler, as a nerd or an outcast because I was a gamer. Right. It's night and day. It's, it's different now culturally. Uh, and I think if I think about what changed, it's probably the inclusivity and accessibility of esports. Um, it became more accessible to the masses. Um, obviously, smartphones helped with that and mobile uh, games like Fortnite that became a huge part of kind of mainstream pop culture. Um, you know, the moment Ninja played with Drake and that was all of a sudden cool and, you know, streamers and professional players. I mean, Ninja was a pro player back, you know, when I competed professionally, we both competed on the, the MLG pro circuit. Uh, but the fact that he then those influencers blew up, became kind of icons and kids now look up to them, watch them as streamers. They're kind of C list or D list celebrities uh, brought gaming into the mainstream and gaming transitioned from being like a niche, a thing that you're a gamer or you game to now it's a, it's a mainstream form of entertainment or activity that anyone does, you know, and actually I personally hate the term gamer because I think it just plays into that niche. Uh, and to call someone a gamer is the same thing as calling someone a movie watcher or a music listener. It's just an everyday form of entertainment that anyone does. And I think uh, over the last 10 years, you know, gaming and esports really, really blew up to become part of that mainstream and just an everyday form of accessible content. So that raises another interesting question for me too, you know, it, just the notion of esports, the idea that we now accept gaming, playing video games as a sport. Uh, you know, you, you've probably heard people question, well, is golf a sport or is dance a sport? And, and I don't know, I don't know what constitutes a sport, but I never would have imagined that it would be, you know, kids playing video games for massive audiences and we're accepting that as a sport. Uh, so where do you think this widespread acceptance uh, came from? Yeah, um, people are definitely accepting it. I think it's it's become a, 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 a widely accepted. Even parents that aren't gamers themselves 
are now becoming in the same way that you have the, the the general term of a soccer mom who goes to their kids' soccer games or soccer dad and cheers them on on the sidelines. You're seeing parents do the same thing for their kids at local land tournaments or collegiate esports events. So it certainly is something that's widely accepted. Uh, in terms of what changed, I think just legitimacy. I think the biggest difference is um, the rise of digital content as a mainstream form of content uh, away from kind of traditional TV and radio and, and advertising meant things like YouTube and Twitch as platforms, you know, came to fruition and dro uh, drove eyeballs, significant amount of eyeballs to to these, these these mediums like esports competitions or streamers playing, which drove ad dollars or revenue, which drove a lot more legitimacy. So the fact, I think overall, there's just a lot more legitimacy, a lot more accessibility of this content nowadays than there was, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I competed. And I think that's the biggest difference. So that's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, the idea that once money's involved, uh, it, it, it helps to, to, you know, not only create new opportunities, but people take things a lot more seriously. And with the advertising dollars, influencer culture, um, all of the things that are now coming to a head around esports. So you not only have esports, but you have all of the uh, YouTube influencers, Instagram, all of these uh, uh, ways that people are actually generating ad revenues and becoming profitable and marketable because of the presence they're generating online. Um, that's also, I think, a significant movement. And it leads me kind of to my next question. What were some of the career opportunities for you when, when you were playing competitively versus what they are now? And what are the new opportunities that you see emerging that are coming out now um, that somebody that's maybe 15 years old is, is wanting to play games professionally, but that's not going to be the end of their career. Where are they going to go from there? What are some of the new opportunities that are coming around because of esports? Yeah. Um, back when, you know, when I was young and, and when I was coming out of college competing, right, I'm 29 years old now. So I graduated in 2014, right? So that was kind of right as esports was starting to blow up. The mo majority of opportunities you had to get into gaming or get into esports was with the the game publishers, the developer themselves within kind of the direct game creation ecosystem, right? I mean, people don't realize, but the gaming industry is two or three times the size of the music industry um, in terms of revenue generated. Uh, it's bigger than the movie industry, bigger than the box office. I think actually it's a now bigger than the movie and music industry combined. So there was always a lot of opportunity to, to work in games and marketing of games, et cetera. But the ecosystem that now is a kind of a secondary or tertiary layer of an ecosystem that supports the games industry, esports, cosplay, hardware and accessories, lifestyle brand. And there's such a wide, and then of course, all, all things digital content on Twitch and YouTube and the like, um, influencer marketing or marketing agencies and so many other areas you can kind of get involved with have created a ton of job opportunities for you know kids coming out of college or people that want to pursue a career in esports or in gaming beyond just going and working for a game developer or publisher or studio. What would you describe as a few of the critical skill sets that gamers are developing that would be valuable at Microsoft, at Google, at Facebook, but also, you know, if they want to go into entrepreneurship, they want to become a doctor, a teacher. I see some really obvious skill sets. I, I want to know if you see the same ones. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I think I see similar ones. I mean, I think the most obvious one that I personally see is just technical skills all up. I mean, gaming is is now introducing kids at a very young age to things like coding, you know, and, and Minecraft to be able to, to be able to do some basic coding to build your own server or creation. Um, and those technical skills are then, you know, turning kids, obviously STEM is a big part of that as well, into developers or engineers. So I think the direct translation and correlation is if you have a passion for games, you likely have a passion for technology, you likely have a passion for coding or, you know, or, or engineering, and that's gonna help you evolve into, into you know, further careers in any of those fields. Um, but then there's also uh, there's the media side. Like I, I personally, I have no technical background. Even though I was, I was a gamer, I was into technology, I was into games. I never learned, and I was never super big into science myself growing up. It just wasn't you know my my thing necessarily. I was more of a marketer, a communicator, a businessman, and and that was kind of my 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 passion. But through gaming and through a passion for gaming, I was able to then get a degree in marketing and turn that degree in marketing and communications into a career at Microsoft, doing a variety of of different things, mostly in the kind of marketing biz dev sales space uh, and obviously esports kind of program management as well so um there, there's there's direct correlation between you know skills you develop in gaming as a pro gamer i learned leadership i learned how to you know command a team i learned organization i had to build up my scrim schedule i learned marketing skills because i had to f apply for sponsors to get sponsored to be able to fly out to these events and that's what kind of directly led to to, to, to the career i have at microsoft and i think those you know those soft skills are transferable to even non-endemic industries like potentially wanting to become a doctor or a teacher or things like that 
Yeah. And that I, I may have shared this with you, but, um, you know, for me, I was very much the same thing. I, I got into learning to build and code computers, not because I cared anything about computer science, computers, coding. I love to play video games, but old school games like Bard's Tale and, you know, some of these these games from like the, the 80s and 90s. And I was poor. I grew up in, in a trailer in Cut and Shoot, Texas. We didn't have a front door on our trailer because it fell off of my stepdad and never put it back on. And so if I wanted to play video games, I couldn't buy a computer. So I would go root around in dumpsters and find broken computers and try to figure out how could I put this sound card on this motherboard back when there was not, you know, linear compatibility in, in hardware. Um, and so I learned to build computers and to, uh, to, to code, to do some basic coding just because I wanted to play games. That was my, my sole motivator. And so I got a lot of those skills that then translated, you know, when I was in college and I was coding for immersive environments and things like that, I could do that stuff, not because I wanted to, but because I learned those skills because I wanted to play video games. Um, so I think you, you, you know, when you talk about those kind of universal skill sets, the digital literacy um, and the tech savviness that you develop just working in, in those environments, um, I think that that's a really important point. And the other thing that I would say then is for me, you know, my one of my big pushes right now with Microsoft VIP and the work I'm doing at University of St. Thomas is around virtual literacy. I believe people that can do what you and I are doing today are going to have certain advantages that other people are not going to have if they can't connect online, if they can't work virtually, um, if they can't stream their gameplay, if they can't create a, a, a YouTube channel, there's certain opportunities they're not going to have. And so I think gaining those virtual literacy and the virtual engagement skills um, is going to be huge and translates to anything else you want to do. If you're a doctor and you're doing telemedicine, your ability to engage with a sick, scared kid effectively on Teams or Zoom is going to, to elevate you above your peers and make people's lives better. Um, so that's you know where I see the benefit of those virtual literacy skills. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of streaming digital media content, influencer culture? How are all these things converging around esports? Yeah, um, I, I love your focus and the point you make around vir virtual literacy is a topic that I think is going to be just across every industry. Really, it's going to be a, yeah, uh, so important. Doesn't matter. It's not just working in tech or working in games where it's important. I think these, I like the examples you bring up, and that's the reality. Is you if you talk to any kind of any gamer ages 13 to 25, 26 years old, for the most part, and obviously I think it extends a little further beyond that, that was very into competitive games, in particular esports, you will be mind blown at, at their virtual literacy, their, their knowledge of how to set up a, a stream or a computer or edit videos or do things in real time. And uh, even though they didn't, they didn't go to a, a formal school to learn these things, they didn't, you know, get get any go to any class or get any degree or certification. They they learned because they did something similar to your story that they're passionate about. They started streaming their gameplay on Twitch. They they literally created a virtual studio inside their own house, which you know back in the day you you need a, a lot of experience to do and, and qualification to do by themselves by teaching themselves. Uh, so any majority of very kind of competitive gamers or kind of hardcore gamers, people that really, really immerse themselves in, in the industry and in the community have developed a, a level of skills uh, in, virt in you know, streaming on Twitch or virtually that I think is going to extend to any career in any industry. It's actually fascinating how, how fast they are moving, and how fast the industry has accelerated. And then combining that into what you mentioned around, you know, the influencer community that's been built as a result, it's just mind blowing. I mean, close friends, teammates that I played with back in the day, are now making millions of dollars a year and wildly successful and brands are willing to pay them thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars for activations because of the eyeballs that they are bringing to those brands. Um, so influencer advertising is now probably going, I think very rapidly going to be the largest and most uh, dominant form of advertising in the next five, 10 years over traditional things like TV, uh, radio, et cetera. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I agree, obviously, 100 percent. And I think that it's also going to translate to when we talk about journalism. You know, I, I'm going to probably offer a class next semester called Media 2.0 that looks at how journalism, I believe, is gone. Traditional journalism, I think, is over. I think um, so when you have YouTube channels, you have social media influencers that connect with people in look at people like Joe Rogan, Russell Brand, you know, these people that have massive followings because they're able to connect um and sort of be the best friend that you're 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 sort of listening having a conversation or you know air quotes a dialogue with all day while you're at work 
the, that used to be kind of the talk radio industry, but I think we've we've created a new paradigm in that with online content. And you know, when when we have an all time low in the confidence that people have in the media, I think that these new media modes are going to be what replaces that. I think the the you know my wife watches a lot of crafting uh, YouTubers and she gets a lot of her information for better or worse from these women that are crafting you know that's where she's getting her her inf- now she'll go look it up and vet it but that's the first source so i think that um that that's going to also be really interesting to see how esports and all of this culture that's coming out of this is going to change so many other aspects of society um yeah. how we engage with information how we think politics global policy all of these kind of things so I, I just yeah. I think it's going to be really big. And yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think there's a lot of great things that come out of that, particularly entertainment and, you know, the ability to learn and get information at, at, at readily available. And then obviously some dangerous things. You mentioned policy and politics and things that, you know, I hope we can, can solve for and tackle uh, because if people are getting their source of information from maybe people that aren't necessarily experts but have a following, um, a lot of misinformation can be spread. So there's obviously a lot of you know difficult challenges we have to tackle. Uh, versus, you, you know, journalism 1.0 or media 1.0, which traditionally the journalist's tr- story was to try and reach the truth. Um, that can be easily kind of straight up, straight far away from if we continue to kind of evolve in the wrong way. So I think there's definitely pros and cons there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's why I think in conversations like this are important is to talk to people about what's going on and be realistic about where it's going so that you can get involved and figure out you know, how do we start to influence these these new modes of, of communication and engagement that instead of just passively sitting on the on the sidelines and it, how can we actually engage with them in productive, instructive, you know, positive ways? Yeah, um, because we don't necessarily want like I, I don't. I don't want my, my wife getting tax advice from one of these random ladies that does crafting just because the lady <laughs> can make really cool gnomes doesn't mean I need tax advice from her. Right. Um, so I, I think it's a, a great, uh, great point. Um, and I'll just kind of close with anything you would you would say to um, to people, whether they're they're high school kids and they're looking at gaming as a potential vehicle in life that's going to take them to where they want to be in terms of their career. Or, you know, older people that maybe looked at some of this with some skepticism, um, what would you say to, to people about where esports is, where you think it's going to go, um, and any tips that you might have? Yeah, yeah, I think I'd probably say the same thing at a high level to both audiences, right? Um, the esports industry, so playing video games professionally for money and the ecosystem that surrounds that, much like the traditional sports and entertainment industry, is here not only to stay, but to grow and to take over. Uh, you know, I think genuinely, and you and I were chatting before we went live, it is it is going to be larger than most traditional sports very soon, already is larger than some traditional sports, and has the potential to be one of the largest sports center or, or entertainment mechanisms in the world. Um, so whether you're young or old, look, if, if it's something you're passionate about, if it's something that you're interested in, invest time, you know, invest time to build these skill sets, to get involved to the audience that's maybe a little bit younger, you have all the time in the world right now for the next six, eight, 10 years of, of your life to pursue this at 150%, you know, get involved, start streaming. If you want to be a professional player, then, you know, put the time into play and compete. If you want to be in the industry, maybe as a shoutcaster or commentator, that's kind of the path I took, start practicing and start, you know, building those skill sets and, and getting your name out there. Um, but take advantage of the opportunity you have right now to pursue this with, with, with every bit of effort you have so that one day you can either, you know, be directly in the ecosystem or work, you know, for a company that supports the ecosystem if that's something you're passionate about. And if you're a parent, support your kids, you know, g- give your kids a chance to, to, to hold on to something they're passionate about, much like you got into technology because you were passionate about games and finding ways to play games by building and creating. I did the same thing. And, you know, we both ended up in careers in tech. I think that's a, another, a good example of, you know, parents out there supporting their kids with passion that they have. Uh, for video games because it can spin off into a career in technology very easily. Perfect. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Can't tell you enough how, how much I, I enjoy, you know, having you on these uh, these segments. And, you know, when we did the the tech rally event. Uh, so John and I did a uh, event for Microsoft maybe a year and a half, two years ago now, yep. beginning of the pandemic, for kids to try to inspire and get kids excited about emergent technology at a time when people were very depressed and there was a lot of tune out on education. And, you know, I, I got a lot of feedback after that event about how inspired kids were hearing you talk about and them taking it back to their parents and saying, this guy's really successful at Microsoft and he used to play video awesome. games. So <laughs> thank you for doing these. And, and, you know, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective 
um, and look forward to connecting again soon. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's humbling to hear that and, and grateful to be involved. Thanks so much for including me and thanks everybody for listening and watching. I really appreciate the opportunity, Dr. Wright. Thanks so much.